While everyone's joining, we want to say thank you for joining us tonight and welcome to the Delaware River Frack Band Coalition's forum tonight. And uh, my name is Tracy Carluccio uh, from Delaware Riverkeeper Network, and I'm a member of the Delaware River Frack Band Coalition. What you're seeing are photos that have been submitted to our Vacation in the Basin Photophon, and we invite you to submit your photos. There's going to be a link put into the chat to help you do that. Uh, there's a new Facebook event that has been formed as well in order to make it easy for people to send in their photos. The idea is to show the Delaware River Basin Commission what we love about our watershed and why we want to defend it from fracking and frack wastewater. Thank you, Taylor, for that great slideshow, Taylor from New Jersey Sierra Club. So this forum, uh, Why Does Frack Wastewater Threaten Your Public Health, is the second in a series, um, our summer series, of the case for a full ban on fracking and its wastewater in the watershed. Our special guest tonight is Dusty Horwitt. He's the author of the report published last week by Physicians for Social Responsibility, Fracking with Forever Chemicals. Dusty worked on this report for several years and is a premier investigator. He's an attorney and he's worked as counsel, researcher, investigator, and author for environmental and policy nonprofit organizations, uncovering many of the egregious issues related to the exposure of the public to dangerous chemical risks in drilling and fracking and other industrial activities all across the United States. In this report, the shocking and outrageous revelations regarding the use of PFAS, forever chemicals, in drilling and fracking is laid bare. We will hear from Dusty about the implications of his investigations and what he found, and what this means for public health, the environment, and for those of us here in the Delaware River watershed as well. And we will learn about the indelible polluting footprint that will be the burden of future generations as a result of the use of PFAS and fracking. Before we go to Dusty, we're going to hear from Doug O'Malley of Environment New Jersey, and he's going to tell us where we're at in our fight to achieve a full ban on fracking here in the Delaware River watershed. Then Dusty will give an overview of his report's findings, followed by an interview. Next, Wes Gillingham from Catskill Mountain Keeper will share our action that we're launching here tonight, targeting the Environmental Protection Agency. And that will be followed by Karen Faradin of Burke's Gas Truth, who will be moderating our question and answer session. Please put your questions into the Q&A box. You will not be able to verbally ask the questions, but you will be able to write all your questions into the Q&A box. And we prefer them to go there so we don't have to sort through the chat in order to find them. Barbara Arendale from Damascus Citizens for Sustainability will close out the forum tonight, and she's going to announce our next series forum for August. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over now uh, to Doug O'Malley. Doug? Thank you so much, Tracy. And it's so great to see uh, so many of our allies, and then honestly, wonderful to see that slideshow, because this is a reminder that you know, this is summertime, we're all enjoying the, the watershed and the river and every place in it, you know, and, and obviously we're here tonight because this is not a given, you know, the fight to be able to protect the Delaware River and its watershed from the ravenous impacts of fracking has been going on for more than a decade at this point. And uh, I know many of you have been, <laughs> been here, you know, for that full time, um, for that full journey when the DRBC, the Delaware River Basin Commission, was considering 
the uh, the resolution going back to 2010 uh, to allow uh, allow fracking. Um, obviously, uh, over the course of the battles uh, more than a decade ago, we were able to achieve a de facto moratorium on fracking and fracking activities in the watershed. I, I just wanted to remind everybody, you know, especially if you have been here with us in that journey, but even more importantly, if you haven't, that you know, it has been a long journey, not only the last decade, but really over the last four years as well. Because a little less than four years ago, in the fall of 2017, the governors of our, our four great states, uh, through the DRBC, uh, moved forward a resolution that would instruct the DRB staff, DRBC staff to develop uh, gas regulations that would transform the moratorium into a permanent ban on fracking. But there was an incredibly big asterisk. And that asterisk, was really quite simple. It would allow fracking waste to be discharged at, into the watershed. It would also allow the transfers, interbasin transfers of water to assist uh, the ravenous industry that is fracking and depends upon massive amounts of water wherever it goes. You know, at that moment, obviously there was a different makeup uh, in the watershed. We still were stuck with Governor Christie. Uh, we unfortunately had uh, the new representative from the Trump administration. And, uh, you know, what we saw over the course of really the entire course of 2017 and 2018 was a massive outpouring with more uh, than 100,000 uh, of you, of the public weighing in and asking, not just for a half ban, not just asking for a ban on, on fracking itself, but a full ban on all fracking activities. And that uh, amount of public uh, outcry, uh, you know, led um, to the DRBC, uh, you know, ultimately, um, to cite that public outcry and those comments in uh, the decision that they just issued this February. And so, you know, we had to fight for close to four years to be able to get that decision. We would not have happened without all of you and without our willingness to stand up entirely for a full frack ban on all fracking activities. The decision that was issued this February by the DRBC in an emergency meeting was to permanently ban fracking in the basin, but they did punt on, uh, they did punt on the long-term, uh, on, the, on the most important, uh, the important issue in my mind is, was the entire ban on fracking, right? So you ban fracking, you also need to ban fracking waste and everything involved with it. They punted on, on that. Now, thankfully, um, and this is why it's so critical, critical, critical that we're here, we're in July, the clock is ticking for DABC. They have until the end of September, September 30th, to come out with, with draft gas regulations to permanently ban fracking wastewater and wastewater withdrawals in the, in the watershed. So we obviously have a job to do, right? There's four governors on the DRBC. Uh, that's Governor Murphy from New Jersey, of course, uh, Governor Wolf from Pennsylvania, Governor Cuomo from New York, and Governor Carney from Delaware, as well as uh, the oft-forgotten but critical representative from the federal government representing the Army Corps of Engineers. And really what we need to do over the course of this fall and leading up to the, the public comment uh, decision or public comment process and ultimate decision is to once again swarm the DRBC with public comment saying the job is not yet done. We need a full ban on all fracking activities here in the watershed. And what we're going to hear obviously tonight is going to back up of why we need to do that and why we are so close, but we're not there yet. Let me turn it back to you, Tracy. Thank you very much, Doug. Now I'd like to turn it over to Dusty Horwitt, who's going to be discussing the report um, that he has issued, which is why does frack waste, I mean, for, for our webinar, why does frack wastewater threaten public health? His report is fracking with forever chemicals. Dusty? All right. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, can everyone see that? There you go. How, how does that look? Does, can everyone see that okay? Great. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, I want to talk about the report that we just uh, released um, with uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility um, on the um, evidence showing that uh, per and polyfluoroalkyl alkyl substances known as PFAS and or PFAS precursors, that is chemicals that could break down into PFAS, have been used for hydraulic fracturing. 
uh, in more than 1,200 oil and gas wells in six different states. Uh, and I want to talk about the implications of this report for um, the debate over uh, importation of wastewater in the Delaware River Basin and use of uh, freshwater in the basin for fracking elsewhere. Um, as I mentioned, we found that these uh, evidence that these chemicals um, have been used or the precursors have been used in six different states, Arkansas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Texas, and Wyoming in hydraulic fracturing, uh, just as uh, a lot of people probably know, but I'll say briefly, fracking is uh, the technique in which companies inject uh, up to millions of gallons uh, uh, into their oil and gas wells, a mixture of water, sand, and chemicals to fracture underground formations and to, um, to free up oil and gas to be uh, collected. Um, just because uh, we found uh, the evidence that these chemicals were used in these six states doesn't mean that that is the extent of the use of PFAS in oil and gas operations. Uh, they may have been used more widely in oil and gas extraction, um, but we don't know because of the lack of full disclosure of the use of chemicals in oil and gas drilling and fracking. Uh, it's possible that these chemicals were used in other states and could still be uh, being used in other states, including Pennsylvania. Could be possible that the chemicals are used in other stages of oil and gas development, including drilling that precedes fracking, in which companies typically drill right through uh, groundwater formations without any steel casing or cement in the well at that point that would protect the groundwater. Um, it could have been used, uh, these chemicals could have been used in different um, types of oil and gas extraction, uh, like water flooding, where companies uh, flood underground formations with water to force out oil. Um, for those who don't know, uh, PFAS have been used in our economy for decades and for a variety of purposes, including in fast food wrappers, um, oil and uh, water resistant fabrics, in firefighting foam, probably most famously in Teflon and in Teflon coated uh, cookware. And it wasn't until about the year 2000, when an attorney named Rob Bellat filed a class action lawsuit against DuPont uh, uh, for uh, pollution caused by one of these, um, these PFAS chemicals called PFOA in the Parkersburg, West Virginia area, that we learned that uh, for years, the companies that made and used these chemicals, especially DuPont and 3M, knew that they were toxic, but didn't tell the public. Um, PFAS are toxic in minuscule concentrations. Um, they persist in the environment. They're almost totally resistant to breaking down in the environment. And they bioaccumulate inside people and inside animals. And that's why they're so concerning. Um, the, the persistence has caused these chemicals to develop the nickname forever chemicals. Uh, they, they're man-made and they have a bond between the carbon and fluorine atoms that is one of the strongest bonds known in chemistry. That's why they're so resistant to breaking down. Um, we found that these chemicals were used by some of the most prominent oil and gas companies in the world uh, and in the United States. Um, there are a, a few listed here. Um, they include ExxonMobil, and its subsidiary XTO Energy, um, Chevron Corporation, Anadarko, and EOG Resources. Um, those four companies we know at least have operated in Pennsylvania. So there's a, a chance that uh, these chemicals could have been used in Pennsylvania by those companies. Um, we, know, we do know that those companies have used the chemicals in other states. You can see Exxon, um, and XTO uh, used, uh, used these chemicals in Texas, Oklahoma, and New Mexico. Chevron used them in uh, New Mexico, Anadarko in Texas, uh, EOG in Texas, um, and Canna Corporation uh, is also one of the co companies that use these chemicals that our um, evidence shows are PFAS or could break down into PFAS. Um, and Canna was one of Canada's top oil producers until they moved here to the US. Uh, our big concern about these chemicals are the health risks. 
and the fact, the possibility that people might be exposed to these chemicals as a result of their use in fracking, drilling, and in the wastewater um, that comes up after fracking and could be disposed of in the Delaware River Basin. Um, the, uh, the, the concern is not just that uh, people could be exposed to the PFAS on their own, but that the uh, PFAS would add to a long list of toxic chemicals already associated with oil and gas extraction, including um, carcinogens like benzene and uh, radioactive radium. Um, there is anecdotal evidence already and scientific studies um, finding health effects associated with exposure to oil and gas operations. Uh, many people may have seen this, um, this report that came out last year, uh, published by the Pennsylvania Attorney General as a result of a criminal grand jury investigation that the Attorney General launched into oil and gas pollution in Pennsylvania. I'll just read a brief um, couple of lines from it. Uh, one of the findings based on interviews with more than 70 families in Pennsylvania who were affected by oil and gas operations said um, many of those living in close proximity to a well pad began to become chronically and inexplicably sick. Pets died, farm animals that lived outside started miscarrying or giving birth to deformed offspring, but the worst was the children who were most susceptible to the effects. Families went to doctors for answers, but the doctors didn't know what to do. The unconventional oil and gas companies would not even identify the chemicals that they were using so that they could be studied. The, the companies said that the compounds were trade secrets and proprietary information. And this is the kind of, uh, of these are the kinds of situations that we've heard about again and again over, year, over the years. And there is scientific uh, evidence that backs up these anecdotal stories, uh, finding um, uh, harms like low infant birth rates and a higher risk of cancer in populations living near oil and gas operations. Um, some of those health effects overlap with the health effects that we know are associated with PFAS, including cancer and low in infant birth, uh, birth weights. Um, some of the other health effects that we know are associated with PFAS include thyroid disease, a high cholesterol, preeclampsia, which is a serious condition affecting pregnant women, and ulcerative colitis, which um, causes inflammation of the intestine. Uh, we also know that PFAS may reduce antibody responses to vaccines and infectious uh, disease resistance, which is a big concern, of course, during the pandemic. Uh, we're, we're very concerned about um, impacts to disadvantaged communities uh, that are often located adjacent to oil and gas operations. Uh, we're also concerned about uh, the most vulnerable populations, uh, pregnant women, children, uh, others, including first responders and oil and gas field workers who may come into regular contact with these chemicals. And we know that there are a number of pathways through which people could be exposed to PFAS and other toxic chemicals in oil and gas operations, including, uh, most importantly for our, for our discussion tonight, uh, wastewater. There can be spills of wastewater. Uh, there can be intentional dumping of wastewater. That's happened in, in at least one case we know of in Ohio. Um, and then the wastewater can be taken to treatment plants where it can be treated and released, uh, but perhaps in a way that does not take all of the chemicals out of the wastewater and discharges them, uh, the chemicals into waterways. One of the, I'll talk about one of the specific concerns uh, about PFAS in this regard in a moment. There are also air pathways through which people could be exposed to PFAS um, including uh, ground level pools of wastewater that could, where chemicals could volatilize, uh, flaring where chemicals could um, become airborne through natural gas that is uh, burned off at the wellhead. And then there could be leaks and spills um, of the chemical tanks themselves at oil and gas extraction sites. Um, once PFAS gets into the environment, it can disperse widely in water as I mentioned, it doesn't break down and it's very expensive and very difficult to clean up. 
we spoke with an expert for our report uh, named Bob Delaney, who had led a team in the state of Michigan, where I live, uh, to address uh, PFAS contamination sites. There are more than 100 in the state of Michigan. And what one thing he, he told us that was alarming is that you can take PFAS out of water by running the water through an activated carbon filter, similar to what you find in a Brita filter, except when it's in groundwater or surface water, the volume of activated carbon filter you need is enormous, and it's going to cost millions of dollars to do that. But then once the filter takes the PFAS out of the water and fills up, the filter is going to fill up with the PFAS, and you have to dispose of that filter somewhere. And he said that landfills can be reluctant to accept that material because they're concerned that their landfill might become contaminated with these forever chemicals and that they might face liability for pollution. So it's it, these are very difficult chemicals uh, to clean up, and that's why we want to prevent pollution with PFAS before it can begin. And as I mentioned, they're, they're so toxic at very uh, microscopic levels. We found that one measuring cup of PFOA, which is perhaps the most infamous PFAS, would be enough to contaminate almost 8 billion gallons of water which is about the amount of water that New York City uses in six days. It's a huge amount of water that could be contaminated uh, based on the standards for drinking water recently enacted here in Michigan. Uh, this, I'll, I'll just uh, end by talking about how this investigation began. And it began with a Freedom of Information Act request that uh, I was involved in filing um, seven years ago now uh, with the US Environmental Protection Agency. We asked the EPA for their records on new oil and gas chemicals that had been proposed for use for drilling and fracking that went through their new chemicals review program under the Toxic Substances Control Act. And what we received over several years was thousands of pages of documents showing EPA's health assessments and regulatory determinations for these chemicals. Three of those chemicals went by the case numbers here, P11, 0091, 0092, and 0093. EPA regulators expressed significant concerns that these chemicals could degrade into a PFOA-like substance um, that would be persistent, bioaccumulative, and toxic in the environment. Um, this was in 2011. When, P, when EPA uh, reviewed these chemicals. And EPA was already well aware in 2011 um, that PFOA and other PFAS uh, were very dangerous chemicals. Um, EPA regulators, in addition, expressed significant health concerns um, about these three chemicals, including liver toxicity, blood toxicity, male reproductive toxicity, immunosuppression, and oncogenicity, or the uh, potential that they could form tumors. These documents were riddled with confidentiality claims, as was typical in these uh, documents that we examined. Chemical manufacturers are allowed to withhold just about any piece of information under EPA's new chemical review program as what's called confidential business information. And so EPA gets to find out what the information is, but the public does not. So here on this slide, you can see that the company that submitted these chemicals for review withheld its own name as confidential. So we can't be sure who submitted the chemical, but we do, um, we do have some idea who may have done it. And I can talk about that later. Um, here's another, um, another slide. At the bottom, you can see, uh, at the very bottom of the slide, you can see the, the phrase CAS registry number. That stands for Chemical Abstracts Services Registry Number. This is a unique identifier assigned to each chemical, which is the best way to identify chemicals. And the company withheld that uh, number as confidential. Um, EPA's regulation of these chemicals was extremely lax. Um, surprisingly, after these significant concerns about the chemicals, including that they could break down into a PFOA-like substance, which is the, the substance that contaminated um, the water in and around Parkersburg, West Virginia, which was the subject of 
Rob Bilot's, uh, Bilot's groundbreaking lawsuit, despite the fact that they have these concerns, they approved these chemicals for commercial use. And one of them actually went into commercial use. And we know that it was used at least as recently as 2018, according to EPA records. EPA allowed these chemicals to be um, used uh, without any testing or tracking to determine where they were being used or whether they were breaking down into a PFOA-like substance as the agency feared. Uh, there were no limits on where the chemicals could be used, say in proximity to drinking water or homes or schools. Um, it was not, um, not very rigorous regulation. And, and then finally, um, I, I wanted to, to talk about just briefly how we made this link from these EPA documents to the evidence that these chemicals, that PFAS chemicals likely were used in oil, in fracking operations in six different states. And that is because one of the few pieces of information that, that um, was available to help us identify these chemicals was what's called a generic name, which is made public when companies withhold the specific name and the CAS number as confidential. And that generic name here up at the top of the screen was called fluorinated acrylic alkylamino copolymer. We then looked for this generic name in a database of fracking chemical disclosure called Frac Focus, which contains records of well by well fracking chemical disclosure across more than 20 states in the United States. The database has a lot of flaws, but it does give some idea of what chemicals are being used in fracking. We did not find any evidence that that specific chemical that EPA approved for use and then went into commercial use uh, was used in the Frac Focus database, but we found six other chemicals with related names that you can see on the screen here, including fluorinated benzoic salts, fluoroalkyl alcohol substituted polyethylene glycol, fluorosurfactants, and others. And we found that those were used in more than 1,200 wells in, more than, uh, in six different states. We then shared that list with four different uh, chemical and health experts, and they identified these chemicals as uh, PFAS, likely PFAS, or chemicals that could break down into PFAS, the way that the EPA regulators worried that the chemical they reviewed could break down into a PFOA-like substance. And, uh, and then there was a PF, uh, EPA master list of PFAS chemicals that included two of these substances. So there was a lot of evidence, um, uh, plus a couple of industry um, scientific papers we looked at that pointed uh, to the, the likelihood that the industry has been using PFAS or chemicals that could break down into PFAS in fracking. And there's a likelihood that they, as I mentioned, that these chemicals may have been even more widely used than the evidence indicates. Uh, finally, uh, we had a number of recommendations in the report, including um, a health assessment, uh, testing and tracking for these chemicals in the environment so the public can know exactly where they've been used and that people could have been exposed. And, uh, and we called for limits on uh, drilling and fracking uh, because of, of the potential that these chemicals um, could be used. And we certainly support um, a, a ban on the importation of, of wastewater into the Delaware River Basin for fracking, in part because um, these PFAS chemicals could be in that wastewater that, that could come into the basin. Um, so uh, with that, uh, let me turn it back to Tracy, who I, I believe is going to ask a few questions. Thank you, Dusty. And um, thank you very much for that informative slideshow. Uh, we welcome. really appreciate uh, the thorough explanation that you've provided about the dangers of PFAS being used in fracking. So uh, Dusty and I worked up some questions in order to um, further uh, enlighten ourselves about how does this apply to fracking in Pennsylvania, uh, fracking generally, and also the Delaware River watershed. So the first question is, it's, it's really shocking to know that EPA approved these chemicals to be used in fracking and drilling, even though they knew they might have the same toxic properties as PFAS, um, such as never breaking down in the environment. So can you explain to us, how did this happen? That's a, that's a great question. Um, and 
well, let me just mention that um, people can access the report on the website of Physicians for Social Responsibility. Um, and I can um, put that link in the chat before we're finished. And you can also access uh, the, some of the media coverage, uh, including the New York Times story and a great editorial that yeah. recently ran in the Philadelphia Inquirer. Um, so why did EPA approve these chemicals? Um, it's, it's sort of shocking once when you read all of their health concerns about them. Um, we asked them explicitly why, and they did not respond. However, we do have um, some guesses, some educated guesses as to why. One of the, the problems with EPA's review of oil and gas chemicals over the years has been their dubious assumptions about how people might be exposed to these chemicals. EPA assumes that any exposures to oil and gas chemicals will only be purposeful and predictable. Uh, for example, they assume that companies will take the wastewater to underground injection wells, which is uh, frequently happens uh, in Pennsylvania that that water is often trucked to Ohio and injected into underground wells, where EPA apparently assumes that it will never leak or spill. Um, EPA assumes the, the wastewater uh, and these chemicals will never leak and spill under any circumstances. And we know, and EPA knows, that that's unrealistic. So it's, it's possible that what EPA did is they knew that there were toxic risks with these chemicals, but they assumed erroneously that the chemicals would never be accidentally released and therefore that exposures to them could be minimal. That's, that's a guess, but we don't know exactly why EPA did what it did. So um, uh, you've talked about the various ways that chemicals are identified when you look at the EPA records and also at FRAC Focus and the other documents that would be filed by drillers with the government. Um, what are CAS or CAS numbers and how important are they in identifying a chemical? Uh, CAS numbers are, are very, uh, very important. Um, and I, I did just want to add that, that um, in response to the first question, EPA did say that they thought that this chemical might be less toxic than PFOA, the, the chemical that they approved. Um, so that could be another reason. However, we know from experience that oftentimes um, companies will develop alternative chemicals to something that's toxic, but then those alternatives can turn out to be toxic as well, or perhaps just as toxic as the original chemical. And we, we know that there are concerns that the new class of PFAS that have been developed are also very toxic and persistent. Um, the CAS numbers are, are very important because as I, as I mentioned, each chemical has only one CAS number, even though the chemical can have multiple names or trade names. So if the public um, wants to know where a chemical has been used, a, a good way to do that though not foolproof, is to look in that uh, frac focus database. But you could be looking for the wrong chemical name in that database. However, if you have the CAS number, there is no chance that you'll make a mistake as long as that matching CAS number is also listed in the frac focus database. The problem is that at the federal level, as I mentioned, chemical manufacturers can withhold that cast number from the public as confidential. And then even at the, at the state level too, the oil and gas operators can also withhold that cast number in Pennsylvania and other states as confidential. So you can have confidentiality at both the federal and the state level. And in that case, companies could be using these chemicals and the public would have no idea. And those are just some of the loopholes in chemical disclosure, and I can talk about others as well. Um, so are you saying that actually um, the drillers themselves might not know if PFAS is in the fluids that they're fracking with? That's right. That has historically been one of the problems that the public and regulators face with oil and gas operations. Um, the companies that typically are required to make chemical disclosure are the well owners or the well operators. Um, the companies in operating in Pennsylvania like XTO or Chevron. However, 
those companies are not in the pos best position to know what chemicals they're using. The companies in the best position are the chemical manufacturers who make the chemicals, but they are allowed to withhold specific information about those chemicals as confidential. And we know from litigation, we know from a, con a congressional investigation conducted in 2011, that some of these companies that use the chemicals in the wells have said publicly that they don't know all of the chemicals they're using. That's what you call deep secrets. Um, right. So, so uh, Dusty, you found that PFAS were used in, in six states, and you talked about how that might not mean that it wasn't used in Pennsylvania, but do you think this is a non-issue in Pennsylvania? Uh, no, it's very much an issue in Pennsylvania. It's very, very important for the public uh, to press uh, regulators, public officials to find out where and whether these chemicals have been used in Pennsylvania. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we know that a number of the companies that have used these um, chemicals or likely have used these chemicals in other states have operated in Pennsylvania. So based on that evidence, there's a chance that PFAS have also been used in Pennsylvania in oil and gas operations. Um, the evidence, as I mentioned, is that these chemicals or chemicals that could break down into PFAS have been used in fracking. But in Pennsylvania, um, companies have to disclose their fracking chemicals, but they can withhold chemical identities as confidential. Um, sometimes, as I mentioned, the operators don't know what chemicals they're using. They, there's no requirement in Pennsylvania that companies disclose the chemicals they're using in drilling, which precedes fracking. So there are many opportunities or there are many scenarios under which companies could have used these chemicals unbeknownst to the public or perhaps even unbeknownst to the companies themselves. And that's, you know, that, that's a, 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 a frightening situation for the people who live near these operations and for people who live in areas that could be receiving the wastewater from these operations that could include these PFAS chemicals among other uh, very serious contaminants. So it's not only um, the four uh, companies that operated in Pennsylvania that you know use these PFAS chemicals in other states, XTO, EOG, Chevron, and Anadarko, but any company, because of this uh, uh, loophole in the Pennsylvania law, uh, any company could have used it and, and kept it secret. That's, that's right. It's, that's entirely possible because of all, all the various loopholes. Um, I mean, the, the evidence that we accumulated shows that you know, those, those four companies likely use these contaminants or precursors to PFAS. And then about 130 companies in total did, but it's possible that any oil and gas company could have. Okay, so um, my next question is, uh, do, does, and you touched on this a little bit, but can you um, confirm for us that Pennsylvania does allow oil and gas companies to use confidential business information to keep the chemicals they use secret? And do they tell DEP or do they just not tell the public? Yeah, we documented um, in a report released a few years ago that companies have extensively used confidentiality claims to withhold from the public, but not from DEP, uh, the identities of fracking chemicals they use in Pennsylvania. So they do have to tell DEP, they don't have to tell the public, um, and they don't have to disclose at all the identities of the chemicals that they use in drilling in Pennsylvania, which precedes fracking. So there's just no disclosure requirement for those chemicals. And then as, as we discussed, there's also the possibility that some of these companies just don't know what they're using um, because right. of confidentiality from the chemical manufacturers, in which case they would not be able to disclose those identities either to DEP or to the public. And what about in conventional drilling and fracking? Do you think these chemicals could have been used there? And do they get to keep secret um, their uh, chemicals, identities? Yes. Um, in uh, Pennsylvania has a, um, a split system of fracking chemical disclosure in which um, companies 
disclose uh, chemicals used in fracking in unconventional wells um, to frack focus, the database I discussed. For conventional wells, they disclose to the DEP directly. And under both reporting systems, they can withhold chemical identities as confidential. Um, the, the definitions of unconventional and conventional in Pennsylvania are a little quirky compared to um, how they're typically defined in, uh, in other states and in the oil and gas drilling as a whole. Um, but but they can withhold the chemical identities in fracking under both systems. And again, under drilling, which precedes fracking, there's no obligation to disclose whether the well is conventional or unconventional. And so there's a, there is a potential that PFAS substances could be used in either type of well. So uh, we want to leave enough time for Q&A uh, from, there's a lot of questions from people and we have a couple other items we want, we want to talk about. But what I, I would like to um, just follow up with a couple other questions here. Um, can PFAS used in fracking fluid get into wastewater and waste solids produced by fracking? And how does this relate to our effort here in the Delaware River watershed to ban wastewater disposal? EPA has said explicitly in its 2016 uh, report on fracking and drinking water that when chemicals are injected into wells in fracking, um, a portion of those chemicals stay underground, but a portion come back up in the wastewater. Um, so we, we know it's a real risk that any chemical used in fracking could be in the wastewater. And so if that wastewater is then imported into the basin for disposal, there's a risk that those chemicals could get into the basin, whether through um, a spill, um, uh, whether it's taken to a treatment plant and treated, the chemicals are not uh, fully um, taken out of the water and the water is discharged into waters of the basin. Um, whether the scenario occurs that the um, regulator in Michigan told us about, whether uh, where the PFAS is taken out of the water and then the filter material has to be taken somewhere for disposal. And that, that could cause contamination also. So there are a variety of, of risks to the basin if uh, wastewater were to be um, imported into the basin. So just one more minute here. Um, you know, I think uh, EPA uh, was going to require that there be some tracking and also some follow-up test for toxicity, for uh, persistence and bioaccumulation of these forever chemicals when they improved it. So is that going on? Is there any tracking going on? And have there been follow-up tests on these chemicals? We're not aware of any testing or tracking for the chemicals that EPA approved for commercial use uh, in oil and gas wells, and, and one of which uh, did go into commercial use. We, we don't know where that chemical was used. Uh, we can't be sure that it was actually used in oil and gas wells. We just know that it was approved for use in oil and gas wells. And then EPA, as far as we know, has not tracked it, hasn't tested for it. EPA has said in past years, uh, in response to questions about testing and tracking of oil and gas chemicals that the agency reviewed, that EPA lacks the resources um, to track and test where these chemicals are used once they go through EPA's regu regulatory system, which um, based on the serious health concerns that EPA had about these, uh, these particular chemicals that they thought could break down into a PFOA-like substance, not to mention the other chemicals, uh, is, is really uh, uh, disturbing. Yeah, I, uh, I think now um, I'm going to turn it over to Wes, Dusty, but one thing I can say is this has made me really furious. I think there's a lot of outrage over your report and the expose of PFAS and fracking fluids. Um, and we feel as a community that we need to take action on this, that this just can't be ex uh, brought to the public and nothing happens. And I know that um, Physicians for Social Responsibility are taking action, but here the Delaware River Frack Ban Coalition also wants to take action. I'm gonna turn it over to Wes in order to um, share with everybody what the action is that we're uh, asking people to take part in tonight. Wes from Catskill Mountain Keeper. 
Thank you, Tracy, and thank you, Dusty, for explaining uh, this very convoluted, um, expansive uh, investigation that you've gone through to get this information that the public should really know about. Now, it really makes sense. If you're a greedy oil and gas executive, of course you want to use a persistent chemical that you're going to pump down into the ground and make your propants go out into that formation and hold and get more gas that way, more money flows in. Of course, that makes sense. What does not make any sense is the fact that the EPA approved that. The EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, what the title should tell them what they need to do in this situation. It does not though. They, as Dusty mentioned, we don't know that they've gone back and, and done any of the studies that they themselves, the scientists within the EPA recommended. Okay, so what's, what's the, um, what, what, where's the hope here with all of this, right? So one of the things in the first 100 days of the Biden administration, uh, there was a laundry list of things that they were going to do with PFAS chemicals. They were going to create, they're going to create an, a, a council on PFAS. They were going to collect new data on 25 chemicals, 29 chemicals. And then they were going to, they're going to work on drinking water standards, look at prohibiting incineration in certain cases. So there is hope here in that they are actually taking a serious look at this. And if we can get comments from the public, from people, from us um, who are concerned about this um, in our watersheds, in our regions, to um, heighten this issue, the fact that they should not, that they haven't done the tests, that these chemicals shouldn't be released into the environment. And I just want to, I'm going to cut this short because I want to save it for a question and answer, but I just want to finish with the what thing that Dusty brought up is that they didn't they all their concerns they approved it because they didn't think people were going to be exposed to it they didn't see how it was going to be prevalent in the environment and i'll just bring bring it back to let's take 12 million gallons of toxic chemicals pump it into the ground with enough pressure to break up the bedrock at 8,000 feet under the ground okay you need to we um, now. I thought we were going to have a screen share of the action to take, or in. I'll pass it on to Karen because she's going to talk about that. Um, but eight thousand feet under the ground with enough pressure, with horrific chemicals that you just listened to, it's time to do something about it. Karen, thanks so much, Wes. And you can look for that link that Wes was just talking about in the chat. Um, and I'm sure it'll be mailed out to everybody afterwards. Um, but thank you so much, Dusty, for your presentation, for doing this report. We have a lot of questions. Um, I want to get to them right away. The first one has to do with um, relating P P PFAS um, and how it's uh, made it through the process to what has happened in the past with the exemptions like Bevel Benson amendments that created special waste or all of those things that happened you know, uh, with the uh, Energy Policy Act that created the Halliburton loophole and all those sorts of things. How does PFAS fit into all of that? Well, I think those, um, those exemptions at the federal level uh, just increase the risks of uh, contamination and exposure to chemicals associated with oil and gas drilling generally, uh, whether we're talking about PFAS or whether we're, um, we're talking about uh, benzene, uh, radium, um, the, the, um, the Benson Bevel Amendments um, basically exempted oil and gas wastes from the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, the federal law that governs the handling and disposal of hazardous waste and requires cradle to grave tracking of hazardous waste. So um, that means that, that the waste from the oil and gas drilling, um, which should be classified as hazardous, um, are not. And it can be disposed of in um, more uh, lax ways. Like they, you know, they're taken to sort of normal landfills in some cases, uh, which should not be taking um, uh, waste with, with serious contaminants in them, like PFAS uh, or radium. Um, the 
the Halliburton loophole or the Halliburton exemption um, exempts oil and gas uh, drill fracking from the Safe Drinking Water Act. And so what that means is that uh, under the Safe Drinking Water Act, if, you, if any of us wanted to inject fluids underground, we would first have to get a permit. We would have to do a site survey to show that there weren't any old oil and gas wells or water wells nearby that could serve as upward conduits um, to bring our fracking fluid that could contain PFAS or other contaminants up to the surface where it could break out into the groundwater. Um, there has to be a pressure test done on the wells to make sure the wells won't leak. Fracking is exempt from that law, except for fracking with diesel fuel. And there's evidence that oil and gas companies have ignored that one small um, piece of, of the, or that's, that scenario that still applies to them. Um, so these exemptions increase the risk of exposure to um, dangerous substances associated with oil and gas um, across the board, whether it's PFAS or other contaminants. And so uh, the second question is related to the first one in that, um, you know, you did find information on six states uh, that are all, are all under all those various federal exemptions. What was different about those six states? Are their own state requirements or something about the way that they report different from the way Pennsylvania reports? We, I, I can't really answer that question. Um, all of those states have, um, fracking chemical disclosure requirements requiring oil and gas companies to, uh, to disclose their chemicals used in hydraulic fracturing. Um, why companies disclose these chemicals as being uh, used in those states, but not in Pennsylvania or Ohio or other Marcella states, um, it's un unclear. It sounds like it was voluntary rather than some different rule for another um, state. Uh, no, the, the um, mo most of these states have um, have requirements that companies disclose their fracking chemicals. However, all of the states that I've seen um, have exemptions under which companies can withhold confidential business information on their fracking chemicals. Um, some of the states, it gets very complicated. Some of the states um, require disclosure to frac focus. Other states require disclosure only to the state agency and disclosure to FRAC focus is, is voluntary, as you suggested. Um, you know, it, it can be both voluntary and required. It's, it's very complex. Um, so it could, the short answer is we don't know, but um, it is still possible that the PFAS chemicals were used in other states, but for various reasons, um, including loopholes in these reporting rules, the, the chemicals just weren't reported. Um, I'm just gonna ask two more real quick ones because we have one more person we need to move on to, but um, the first one has to do with what could happen in Pennsylvania. Uh, would, for instance, Governor Wolf be able to now direct the DEP here to test fracking waste to go look for those chemicals that you found elsewhere or evidence of elsewhere? Uh, as far as I know, he could uh, order the DEP to do that, um, and, and people should demand that the DEP do that. Um, I, I'm, uh, I'm concerned that the oil and gas companies um, could stonewall DEP. Um, many people here may have read the book um, Amity and Prosperity about the impacts of, of fracking in Western Pennsylvania. And one of, the, um, one of the scenes in that book was about how the, uh, there was a court order that a company uh, turn over the names of its fracking chemicals and years went by and the, the company just didn't comply. So it's, it's gonna take uh, pushing on the, the Wolf administration and then it's gonna require probably follow through from the Wolf administration to find out where these chemicals have been used. Yeah, I just want to interject here, and we only have a couple minutes left, but um, there is a PFAS sampling plan um, that was carried out uh, by the Wolf administration, and um, there was uh, identified uh, locations in Pennsylvania where they found PFAS, but um, 
Delaware Riverkeeper Network and others have complained to DEP that their sampling plan was far too limited. And this opens up the issue of the need for sampling that's much broader than what was done. It was only done in select locations. We need to test now where fracking has been done. The other thing that they did not do in Pennsylvania in their sampling plan was test any private wells at all. So we really have a lack of information that is, has biased uh, the findings so far that Pennsylvania has about how much of an issue, you know, how much PFAS has been found across the entire state. We know that Bucks and Montgomery counties are particularly uh, impacted by the military bases. And there are other places throughout the state, Harrisburg, Pittsburgh, that have also been found to have PFAS, but fracking has occurred in two thirds of the state. So this opens up in an, really a huge amount of landscape in Pennsylvania, wherever fracking has occurred. It, the only way to find this out, in our opinion, is we're not going to find it out voluntarily from the drillers. We have to find it out by actually having testing done. It's the only way to find out. You have to test the, the groundwater, uh, the soil, the sediment, uh, you fed fish. There's a whole lot of different environmental media that you can test to find it. I'm sorry to take that much time. And we, I think there was one more question and we only have two minutes left and we have one more speaker. So yeah, Karen. And, and thank you. I have one quick question. I hope, <laughs> um, and I'm going to turn it over to Barbara. And there's one I saw that I can actually answer in the chat because it's just a link. Um, so the final question is somebody who's trying to protect themselves. Can they use a reverse osmosis filter? And then what would they do with it to dispose it of it? Yeah, they can use a reverse osmosis filter. Um, uh, also, the um, granular activated carbon uh, is another treatment system. Uh, but which is better depends on what particular PFAS compound you're actually treating for. And actually, a treatment train is found to be the best. Uh, we did have an expert look at this, and we put that on the record in Pennsylvania. Uh, that you really should probably have a treatment train in order to be safe. In terms of how to dispose of it, it's an issue and it's not resolved. And right now, uh, people do not believe, uh, we do not believe that it's being handled properly. In some instances, they're actually going into landfills. And so you can think how outrageous that is. All right, thanks so much. And um, thank you, Dusty and Barbara. I'm so sorry to be turning it over to you so late, but take it away. <laughs> Okay. Sorry, um, could I just ask one quick question? Um, I was trying to go into the chat to uh, include the web address for the PSR report, and I wasn't able to get into the chat. Is there somebody who could put that in there or help me get in? I'm going to put some links in the chat, things like that, and, okay, and answer you. one of the questions. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I'll just say that a recording of this webinar will be sent out to every registrant, and with it, all the links and additional links where you can get more information. Barbara? Okay. Um, hi, I'm Barbara Arendelle, Director of Damascus Citizens for Sustainability, or DCS. Tonight, we've heard details about the background and current situation regarding fracking and potential frack waste import into the Delaware River Basin. We've also had a hair-raising overview of some of the forever chemicals that we could expect to be in the waste brought into the Delaware Basin if import is sanctioned by the DRBC and what those chemicals could do to human and environmental health. Wes and Tracy um, have given us action alert tools we can use to keep the basin safe. And now that fracking itself is banned in the basin, we still have to prevent the import of this toxic fracking waste. Seems crazy, but here we are. Educate yourself, your neighbors, and since this webinar has been recorded, use the recording, a link to which will be in an email to all registrants that we'll get in the few, next few days and we will post. And next month, we will have a truly hot topic. On Wednesday, August 18th, Rolling Stone author, Justin Noble, will be with us to speak on the radioactivity in frack waste. That kind of hot we surely don't need. Look for the registration link in that same follow-up email.
And thank you to our featured speaker, Dusty Harwood, all the Delaware River Basin Coalition partner organizations and speakers and to all attendees. We do have more work to do, but we have the tools, knowledge and willingness. We will do this. Thank you and good night all. Thank you. And we are gonna see the slideshow. Thank you, Taylor.